Okay, so welcome everyone to our second meeting in a series called Innovative E-commerce with Divanta. Today, we will focus on the hottest industry, I mean on fashion. Before, I will let our special guest to tell you a bit more about fashion industry, future trends, predictions, and modern technologies. Uh, let me quickly introduce you myself. I'm Agnieszka and I'm marketing product owner of Progressive Web Apps at Divanta. And today during the webinar, I will make sure that everything's going well um, during our meeting. Um, please welcome warmly our speakers, Stanley, Agata and Julermo. Stanley, you can take over and also introduce as yourself, let me share the screen with the presentation and we can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this warm welcome. I had to turn my AC on because it is actually too hot. So, <laughs> so that works great. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Stanley. I'm a, um, I'm a product manager at this point in Devante. Um, I started as a developer then I was a designer. So I'm kind of flowing uh, from working as a developer to working as a designer, then working as a e-commerce consultant to being a um, product manager at this point. And um, the topic that I'm gonna talk about is um, strictly related with analytics. And because although through this whole journey, I saw that this is the point that everybody speaks of, but uh, not there are not many innovations on this one. So yeah, nice to meet you. Okay, and uh, should I start with my presentation right now? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Then we will so, introduce the uh, rest of the speakers. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So should I share my screen? Okay, let me give me for the remote control and let me give me the second because uh, okay, I think I got it. And so the topic is um, you know it's called uh, I want to talk about the analytics, but um, I want to talk about why analytics is as it is, why we decided to use it in the current form and why I believe it's flawed. So first of all, the privacy. And as you may have heard, uh, the few last years were a big revolution when it comes to the privacy. Apple is going, pushing a lot, the whole privacy thing. They're very um, strongly communicating the fact that uh, they will be focusing on this one. And the biggest move that they made is the, is, okay. I think I lost control of the screen. Yes, I did. Yes, I think I lost control of the screen. Okay, it's okay now, it's okay. Uh, so while all of these changes are good for the users, for people, for us as users, they are, uh, let's say, not so great when it comes to those of us who want to run analytics, run some marketing, do some UX, or uh, perform any other kind of activity related to calculating and relying on data because we have less and less of it. So the while previously, let's say, we had a, some kind of a set of the data that uh, we used and it was widely available that uh, you could collect third party cookies, you had access to everything that was going on in the apps. Then with the introduction of iOS, okay, 
this was supposed to be like the dramatic uh, shift in this presentation. You're gonna uh, imagine this uh, with the introduction of iOS 14.4, Apple, uh, Apple restricted um, access to the data from the apps. And, and for some, it was more harmful, for some it was less. But what's quite interesting that it was even very harmful to Apple themselves. They lost a lot, around 30% of revenue from uh, App Store, which is like the tremendous amount. So this is just one step that uh, reduced amount of data that we have. And uh, EU is preparing further regulations when it comes to restricting the data. I'm sure you've heard about the cookies uh, being removed from Google Chrome. So with time, we will have smaller and smaller picture of what's actually going on with uh, our business. So as you can see, this, these scattered elements, they kind of give you some idea of uh, what do, do you work with, what's actually happening with your business. But uh, the problem with seeing structured, fractured image is uh, the fact that when you just see the piece of image, it's very easy to tell yourself, okay, uh, I know what's actually in here. I, I know what this picture represents. But sometimes when you see the full picture, you realize that, oh, actually it's quite something different than I thought it is, right? So this is the problem with the fractured data. You don't know if, uh, you don't know if what you get is the complete picture, if you're actually seeing the truth and is this enough data to work on? So, this trend will only be deepening uh, as as you can see here uh, of course we are now in web 3.2.0 but we are going in the direction of web 3.0 and uh, one of the key elements of web 3.0 is decentralization what it means is basically even less leverage on the company side. So everything will be distributed, uh, anonymous. It will be even harder, hard to measure everything and uh, to force users, let's say, to accept our analytics and our approach. So um, of course, that's, uh, that's not so great when, when you think about it, but uh, maybe this approach wasn't the approach that we had like relying on all this clicks that uh, we can get wasn't the best in the first place because uh, you see um for example airbnb when uh, the whole pandemic thing started they cut their marketing costs down to zero and they uh, they saw that 90%, 95% of the traffic remained. So basically what it means is that they reduced a tremendous amounts of marketing budget down to zero and the business barely changed. So you can think like, whoa, so that means that all those money that they were spending it was actually uh, wasted because, uh, you know, here they are, not doing anything, and the traffic is the same. But uh, the thing is, while this is a great headline, yes, that sounds very good, um, there is way, way more to, uh, to this fact. Because uh, you see, ads are not just what, uh, ads are not just what the panel tells you are not what you see in the dashboard that reports uh, reports to you. Because um, look, you could easily say that, uh, let's not have any strategy, let's just Facebook figure it out. Because 
basically businesses nowadays have two channels, Facebook and Google, right? And uh, you can put like all your budget in, in, in Facebook and tell it, hey, Facebook, this is a budget run dynamic ads and you figure it out. Okay, it will work, it will sell. You can in the same manner forget the keywords, forget the SEO and just uh, launch the dynamic ads, you know, just uh, on the Google, it does Yeah, because they have a very good uh, return of investment. So yeah, let's just do this. Um, but, but what does it mean? It means that you have really no idea what you're doing. You're just uh, letting the algorithms decide everything. And while it's okay for now, uh, you kind of lose the understanding of the business. And uh, also you can think like, oh, TV is dead. But uh, well, that's actually not true. It's just measured in a different way than we measure Google and Facebook. Because, uh, uh, you know, we can easily measure Google and Facebook, while TV is a bit complicated and uh, the effect is stretched in time. So if you measure it in the same way, you obviously won't see the results. Um, also, there are many approaches, and this is something that I know for a fact is happening in many companies, is the approach that awareness is a scam, that it basically doesn't work, that it uh, doesn't bring uh, new business, and that it's not worth doing it. Well, it's it's kind of like saying that, yeah, you know, all this budget that Airbnb was investing wasn't really worth anything because when they cut it, the business stayed the same. I mean, yeah, it stayed the same, but for how long? If they if they didn't went back to the investing budget, how long would they try? You know, it's it's just a moment. So the most important lesson there is is the fact that the attribution that you see in the dashboards of each tool that show you, oh, this many people came from Facebook, this many people came from Google. They're not actually showing you the increment in your business uh, that each channel had. So when you look at it, you see how many people came through Google, for example, then, okay, this is the attribution of the Google, but maybe these people saw the ad on Facebook and then they went to the Google and just typed it in and they saw the ad and they went through it. So maybe the ad wasn't actually essential in the whole process, or maybe they got the referral and they would go even if there wasn't an ad because they were searching specifically for this thing. Uh, so it's not so obvious. So the problem with the tools right now is that Measuring attribution, first of all, is way easier because you can easily measure it. Second of all, um, digital, like Facebook and Google, obviously, by showing the attribution, they can say, oh, look, we are better than the other solutions. Plus, uh, they get all the income attributed to themselves. So they kind of prove to the businesses that, look, this is how much we brought. But they're not telling the whole story. Uh, about what happened before them. So what can we do? Actually, there is a new solution to it and it's straight from 9070. I hope you recognize this car in the reference. It's hard to find a PNG. Um, so the, the thing is, look, back in 1970s, they didn't have a, they didn't have a digital, um, Sorry, I need to turn this off. They didn't have a digital marketing. They didn't have a dashboard that could tell them uh, the attribution. They had to rely on increment, on business increment. But the thing is, it was, uh, it was hard to measure something like a effect of radio, effect of TV ads, and effect of, let's say, flyers. But uh, what they did back in 1970s, so it's quite a long time ago, um, they, a bunch of smart people um, met together and in order to measure all those channels indir indirectly, 
they created something that's called MMM. And uh, yes, if you think this is what, what you think it is, you're right. This is mixed martial marketing. This is the situation where two marketers were meeting in the office and they were fighting. And the marketer that won uh, got the budget for their channels. And this is the way um, the marketing budgets were decided back in the day. Yeah, I know it is really controversial, but this is how it worked. <laughs> but yeah, actually in truth, MMM stands for Marketing Mixed Modeling. And uh, it's uh, just a smart way of calculating the impact of each certain element. So what impact did the promotions have on your business? If you run a promotion, maybe it boosts your sales now, but what is the long-term effect? If you run a TV ad, then for how long it will boost the sales and how, and how each dollar invested in each channel uh, or, uh, Im improved your business. This is the really, let's say easy to calculate when you take how much budget you spent for everything and how much increment you got. You're not looking at the steps in the middle. You're just looking how much I spent, how much I got. And you're also considering the, um, in, the effect in time, the kind of stretch of the effect. The thing with uh, modeling like this is the it has a very big advantage because it provides you the effects that are really, really good. They're, they're really handy. They provide you the very good information and are um, usable. I would say, look, the stuff that you get, you have long-term influence of each channel, of each activity that you, uh, that you did. You can measure intangible things, such as a brand recognition impact. And look, in a fashion industry, what can be more important than impact of a brand? Uh, as you know, high brand fashions, they never run uh, like strictly performance uh, marketing. What they do is they work with influencers, they run a fashion shows, they put their clothes on, for example, specific people. And the models like this uh, give the possibility to measure tangible things like this. Like, okay, how did the cooperation with this one work for us in, let's say, two year long uh, span time? Or how does this specific show worked out for us? And uh, of course, last thing is uh, channel independence. So how does one channel work for in the second one? For example, how, does, how did the TV ad boost uh, Facebook, for example? And uh, yeah, so you can get a lot of smart stuff from this, like a uh, channel attribution, which tell you directly how much each channel contributed to your success. Saturation curves, which are actually my favorite ones. As you can see how much, let's say saturated is each channel. As you can see this one as well. It has a, it's very steep. So every dollar invested has like big response. And for example, here it's over invested. It will be, way better if it was here, right? So saturation curves are magic. And uh, with this, you can create pretty easily the budget locator that tells you, hey, you spend this much, you could be earning this much for the same amount of money. But the biggest problem with the MMM is, as you can imagine, it's great. It provides really good results. And uh, it's what the companies use. It's what most of companies use, like the big brands, uh, they all have MMM. But the problem is with the smaller players is that it's expensive because you got to work with agencies. I don't know if you noticed uh, here, but I uh, shame shamelessly stole it from Nielsen. As, as you can get, uh, as you probably know, Nielsen is not a cheap company to work with. No. Oh. So, yeah, so the problem is it was expensive. So how can, how can we get this solution back from 9070 right now? And uh, the, the answer is, 
the answer as I get back control of the screen. Yeah, so first of all, why is MMM expensive? Because it has a lot of data that need to be processed. There is a thousand of models that needs to be done and there's a lot of repetitive work. And that sounds exactly like something that machine learning does perfectly. So when you combine the old technology from 9070 that gives you really good analysis with machine learning that we have today and a computing power that we have, you can have an ideal solution that first of all is cheap and second of all provides very good results. And this is the idea behind Robin, the product created by Facebook currently. And uh, it's in an experimental phase, but Robin basically lets you, it's an open source code and it lets you create your own marketing mix modeling for your business. So I would say, check it out. <laughs> we are currently working on Robin together with Facebook team to uh, improve Robin and to improve the, to create like the more advanced version, version of Robin with easier introduction to it. But basically what you can get is a thousand of models just computed by AI. Each point here is, uh, let's say, oh, you can see, for example, each point can be a thousand of iterations. So there's a lot of them and it's all automated for you. So it's very handy. And then you can have a results with the uh, saturation curves. As I said, they're amazing with attribution divided for you, a real ROI and stretch in time that each channel has on your business. So this way you can measure what is your awareness, how does top funnel activities work for you, how to improve your performance and how remarketing can be done even better. So yeah, I'm encouraging you all to try something different than the last click analysis. Hope that's been informing and uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Stanley, for your presentation. Uh, in the beginning, I forgot to mention that uh, after the webinar, we will send you the recording of the webinar together with the presentation and the summary. And I would like to hand over to Agatha, our next speaker today. Okay, hello, everybody. I will try if the remote control works. It, it works. Great. So. Uh, hi, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, thank you for your attendance and thank you, Aga, for, for creating the ability of gathering uh, us uh, together here. So, yeah, uh, on my daily basis, I work at Divante Innovation Lab, where together with my team, we conduct one month innovation sprints uh, in order to, to solve uh, our partners' uh, challenges uh, and problems by creating, validating and testing uh, some digital solutions. Uh, yeah, and my lecture, my today's lecture has three goals um, that also defined a structure, its structure a little bit. Um, so um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Generation Z based on reports and, and, foc and be focused mainly or on these insights that might be crucial while uh, creating uh, future-proof e-commerce solutions, let's say. Uh, later on, I would like to briefly tell you uh, about meta trends that I can see uh, coming from social ex uh, expectations and how they might be transferred into e-commerce solutions. And the third part will be divided into five uh, sections. Each of them will address one uh, digital uh, area uh, being um, currently on, on top in the fashion uh, industry. Uh, with it trends, uh, of course. And in general, the, the whole topic of fashion e-commerce uh, trends, it's, it's much wider than the presentation. And, and anyway, I, I try to select this information that might be most relevant for you. Uh, so I guess we shall start. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, Generation Z. Uh, let's have a look at, at, at Gen Z Essentials. So McKinsey studies uh, conducted in Brazil uh, tells us that, that Gen Z reps are the people seeking truth. 
uh, which in their that, that which which also is their main motivation to to consumption um, in both like in a personal perspective and, and communal form um, this generation feels comfortable not having one uh, only way uh, to to be to be itself to be themselves uh, it's it's search for uh, authenticity uh, generates greater greater freedom for their expression and and greater openness to understanding that there are different kinds of people and understanding them and here is the example uh, on this chart uh, where you can see that that how they approach uh, to the truth might influence their purchasing decisions so over 70% of respondents uh, uh, over 70% of, of respondents being these uh, zoomers declared that they wouldn't buy any products uh, or even promote brands that consider as being manifesting as as uh, consider as as manifesting sexism homophobia or racism so that's uh, one thing uh, now let's 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 focus maybe a little bit more on digital habits mm, here are coming uh, results of this of the studies uh, conducted by Accenture, uh, it it was um, it was done in Poland. So these are Polish respondents. Uh, in general, one third of respondent, respondents use streaming platforms at least once a day, and that gives a huge opportunity for brands uh, when it comes to live commerce. And about live commerce, we will talk a little bit more later on. Um, and, and what about social media and how they are defining uh, the product's decision-making process? So uh, it's worth mentioning that 57% of Zoomers, of respondents, use social media to learn about promotions. Uh, 41 learns where to buy a product and 38 uses social media to get familiar with current trends. Um, okay, what's more? Um, 31% of uh, respondents uh, say that takes into account influencers reviews or opinions while deciding what product to buy. And after shopping, over 20% of Zoomers shares what bought via social media. That's, uh, in my opinion, extremely uh, promising thing uh, for brands uh, having strategies based on user-generated content. Uh, okay, uh, let's move forward. Uh, so here I wanted to share with you uh, what are the willingness of Zoomers to, to try new digital solutions. So uh, about 60% of, of respondents uh, declared that at least once uh, in a lifetime would like to use solutions helping to choose the right size uh, of their clothes. 53% said that they are interesting, uh, interested in trying some virtual uh, fitting uh, rooms, like virtual, virtual trying ons um, provided with AR or VR technologies. 43% uh, uh, of respondents declared that would like to use social commerce. Okay, and uh, now I guess we might go through the social trends and, and, and see how these Zoomers characteristics, but also other factors influence some of, of meta trends to be followed. Uh, okay, so first of all, we've got the su sustainable clothing and sustainability is about uh, having impact, positive impact. Uh, on at least one of these uh, areas, so uh, uh, at least on uh, ecology or society. So what uh, fashion e-commerce might do in this field? Let's see. Um, okay, there is a first example. So um, brands can communicate about the price in the transparent way to make customers uh, conscious about what they really pay for. And we have a brand uh, here on the example, which is Elementy, uh, the Polish brand that, that show prices of all products with the exact information about how these costs are divided to uh, materials and, and labor, taxes, company costs and markup, and also some social initi initiatives. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, reporting uh, by companies the sustainable advantage, let's say, and uh, by the example of the American uh, company called uh, Girlfriend, uh, which is shown here on the screen, 
uh, we can see that product pages are might be enriched with some information of, of the environmental costs of, of uh, the production of, of the products. Uh, and when you visit the Girlfriend website, uh, which I really encourage you to, to do so, uh, you will be able to see a sub page uh, about us. And there uh, all, um, uh, let's say, their thoughts why they think they are sustainable. Uh, there are plenty of certificates and association they, they belong to mentioned and, and other information on their general approach uh, that might be considered as sustainable, including health and safety rules or for example, employees working hours. Uh, okay, the, the next thing, which is in my opinion, quite massive and systematic problem uh, when it comes to the environment uh, it is the challenge of delivery and, and product returns environmental costs. There are many, many approaches due to this challenge. Uh, first of all, companies might inform customers about where products are sent from to let them make their uh, own decision uh, if, 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 uh, if the delivery would be uh, environmental friendly or not. Um, but what is even more important uh, is to avoid the risk of returns. Um, so, is, so what we need to do is to help users with being sure that, that the product will fit them. So next solutions I will present are not only like about improving user experience, what we usually consider this solution to be, uh, but we are also, uh, we are also, they are also needed to be considered uh, as avoiding the risk of poten potential mistruths uh, by the user. And what, what we might done. So uh, it might be done by providing photos of, of, of products by on, on various models with different size, like here, here we've got like two people, uh, or might be done um, on many more. Like here we've got, for example, 16 other, uh, 16, uh, 16 different models. Uh, with exact dimensions given here and what uh, size uh, they were. But uh, for sure, it, it might um, seem to be expensive um, for, uh, and, and you might consider maybe cheaper options. So here, uh, the, the way might be attaching to your product page user-generated content, uh, which in this case is a photo coming from the uh, customer wearing the product and, and taken from the uh, Instagram post or, for example, from Instagram stories. Uh, like a really uh, quick win, uh, I guess, and it's kind of obvious, ob obvious choice is to extend the product presentation with a product video that shows the product in a movement. Uh, so yeah. And while, while, while speaking about uh, sustainable clothing, we need to mention uh, the re-commerce um, topic, which is about reselling second, secondhand clothes. Uh, Forbes magazine informs that the resale market uh, is projected to, to double in the next five years, reaching $77 billion. And here, uh, as you can see, th this category I want you to tell about is um, our shops that handle resale on their, sell on, on their own, like here Zalando and its pre-owned project. Or like uh, FredUp, which has 10 years experience in e-commerce uh, and decided which is really interesting, we decided to build a business model based on, on their experiences. And what is this model, business model about? So um, it's called Resale as a Service. Uh, and the company, FreedUp, delivers software platform and support business clients uh, willing to have their own resale shop. And what they've done uh, already is, for example, partnership uh, with uh, Madewell. So uh, Madewell is one of the companies that have already implemented the resale as a service software coming from the FredUp. But there are any there are uh, there are others on the list and others uh, that announced combining forces with FredUp, like Adidas, for instance. But don't think that um, FredUp is, is like only solution uh, offering uh, re-AAS, so resale as a service. There are many more. Uh, for example, uh, Levis uh, has its second hand provided by another such company uh, called Trove. If I spell it correctly, I'm not sure, but okay. Uh, so 
there are many ways to do it. Uh, the next so social trend is gender is gender neutrality. So uh, lacking qualities to typically associate with, with either sex. Uh, the idea is that e-commerce owners, managers, or other people who, who handling the, the e-commerce systems should avoid distinguishing roles according to people, people's sex or gender. Solutions that are coming together with the gender neutrality in e-commerces are uh, as, as following. So for example, uh, during the research, I've noticed um, gender, gender neutral navigation. So not dividing clothes by gender, but mainly by the collections uh, that are intended for everyone. I've got also another example uh, here. There is no gender uh, mentioned. Mainly we work with uh, the wording and, and, and the variety of collections. Yeah, but um, the next big thing while realizing the gender neutral uh, e-commerce strategy is dealing with product pages. Uh, for sure, if, if it's really it's really worth adding products, photos worn by, by, by various models, uh, these having more uh, masculine attributes and those um, with, with more feminine traits, let's say. Uh, so there, there are some challenges about that that I will, I will not cover today, uh, but might be, might be hard to, um, to challenge. It's, for example, sizing and descriptions of, of gender neutral products. But let's, let's, let's see some examples of gender neutral product presentation. Yeah, and after this warm up with the social trends, we are ready to, to dig into trends that are coming directly from the fashion uh, e-commerce. Uh, so here we, you, you will see five areas, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and the first area, which I will tell you about, is live commerce. And uh, yeah, um, the, the most general definition I found is that live commerce is something that combines uh, insta instant purchasing of a featured product and audience participation through interactions. But what is of also worth mentioning is that the pioneer of in this field, so Chinese Taobao Life, which is a part of Alibaba Group and was um, and raised uh, six years ago, um, says also that by live commerce, shoppers can watch, be entertained and learn about new trends. Yeah, and the question is why to invest. Um, while speaking about Taobao, uh, we need to consider some numbers. So top accounts uh, being active on Taobao, top merchants uh, are viewed by uh, 266,000 and it might and such amount of views might bring to these companies about 75,000 orders. So it gives a conversion rate on a level, level of 28%. Uh, if I if I counted it correctly, but I guess so. Uh, what, what's more, uh, in survey conducted in 2020, two thirds of Chinese consumers said that they bought something, uh, they bought some products via live stream in the past year. Two thirds of Chinese. I know that's that's Asia Asia case. That's a different market. But when we recall the the statistics, the, the statistics I I I. Uh, I gave you at the beginning um, about Polish Zoomers, uh, which say, which says that one third of them use a streaming platform at least uh, once a day. That's that's make uh, live commerce kind of promising. So, yep, uh, as McKinsey report says, almost 36 percent of all live commerce shows were intended to sell uh, clothing and apparel assortment. That's also kind of promising for the for the industry. Mm, I prepared a division of, of live commerce providers. Uh, let me briefly introduce you the scheme. So uh, the scheme, uh, first of all, we've got, um, I mean, you can, you can conduct a show via your social media channels. It's good to choose these social media channels where you have already a social commerce store built. Uh, then you would be able to mark products over the showtime. Uh, but about social commerce itself, I will tell you a little bit more, to, more later on. Uh, so the, the second group are um, solutions that to be integrated with your own channels, such as your website or your e-shop. Uh, th there are many more, but here I wanted just to give you some examples. Uh, the third group uh, is platforms or, or even med media platforms that gather together 
various merchants. Uh, so these portals describe themselves as community platforms that user that users can browse multiple brands live show uh, live shows at, at the same time. Yeah, and uh, when when it comes to um, trends that I uh, discovered during the research, um, I have three to be shared. And let's start from live shows. Uh, so by that, I mean that designing a stream um, should be not just uh, understood as products presentation, but as a complete, a complete experience. So here is an example. Uh, I, I am bringing to you how the network uh, platform uh, approach live shows. Uh, they offer users uh, some programs with wider contexts. Let's 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 take an example unhinged. So uh, so here comes the quotation. I will read you how they talk about this show. Is network uh, networks weekly show? Uh, sorry, it's uh, networks weekly love shopping, sex and dating show hosted by residential love guru and former DJ. Amrit. The show's concept grew on Amrit's wide ranging love related posts on her Instagram account during the pandemic. Unhinged features, uh, features Amrit advice for call in guests and live chats around viewer submitted questions. Its ex exclusive weekly product drops include uh, the list apparel and accessories. So as you can see, the product presentation is only like an additional thing. Uh, the program is not about like selling the products, but it's about the, 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 the complete experience. So that's the, the one trend. The second trend that I can uh, recognize is about new ways of uh, interactions uh, available for users during such live shows. For example, Tommy Hilfiger uh, provided a voting button uh, intended to let users decide uh, on the best fitting product to the specific uh, set or that, that that was presented. Uh, that was that yeah uh, that was presented. Sorry. So the second feature I, I would love to share with you is um, is the wheel available av available to uh, U platform customers. So uh, now I will uh, play play. Okay, maybe it will work. Okay. We're a community. We look out for each other. And us here at U, we look out for you watching the shows. So to mix things up a little bit, every now and again on a live show, we do something called a wheel. Now, this is like a wheel of fortune, if you will, and you spin it on screen and it lands on a discount. I'm talking £1 to £30 off your order. How amazing is that? Especially if you're feeling lucky. So if you're watching the show and you see something that you think your mate would really like, we've made it super easy to share the live. It's literally one click. You can share it with your mate, they can come in, and if they then share it with another 10 of their mates, they can all come into the room and you can talk amongst yourselves, you can talk with the host. And the more people we have in the show, the more likely we are to do a wheel. Yeah. So this is how, how works the, the wheel. And uh, yeah, while speaking about uh, the live commerce, it's, it's also worth, uh, worth mentioning that uh, the, 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 the field of engaging people in live shows. So of course they could be influencers, but what experts say is that instead of paying a lot of, uh, a lot of money for macro influencers, uh, fr from the budget perspective, it's sometimes better to involve uh, micro influencers. Another trend uh, that that um, experts, another trend is to um, involve experts and um, inviting them at live shows. So, for instance, uh, Tommy Hilfiger organized a stream with the company's lead designer to talk uh, a little bit more about a presented collection. Um, Okay, so the next thing is social commerce, uh, the next area. Um, and in a nutshell, social commerce is about um, discovering and buying products directly or partly from social media. Uh, on this slide, these rectangles marked on, on blue uh, are these uh, providers being the most popular and, and major ones. 
in the field of social commerce, but it doesn't uh, mean that there are no more. There are and there will be probably uh, more on the market. So just keep it in mind. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the question is, why, why should you invest? And, and as we know, social, social medias are channels where, where people are getting familiar with uh, new products, new ideas. Uh, and when you look at the graph, which comes from TikTok studies conducted by work agency, you would be able to, to see that respondents, uh, that there was, uh, that they were asked with a question, uh, have you ever purchased a product or service after seeing it advertised or reviewed on social media? And here all these um, numbers says about about pre, uh, about uh, groups of people that said yes, it happened. Um, so so that's that's massive, I guess. As as we can see, it's like. Uh, there are differences between countries, but uh, 78 is still like a, a big number. Um, yeah, and, and why, uh, why social commerce is worth investing if you are representing uh, the fashion industry? So Accenture studies pro projected that the global rate of, of fashion uh, share in, in social commerce will be about 18% by 2025. Um, and here I, uh, I brought you an overall, overall uh, comparison of four main providers, so I will not go through, um, through them uh, in details, but just I would like to tell you about consistent direction for uh, all of these channels. So uh, social medias probably will be developing their ability to integrate with more and more e-commerce platform because it's already happening. More shoppable interactions will be coming to these platforms and checkout within the social media platform is like important feature that provides uh, that some providers are already uh, uh, has already implemented and some are working on them to be implemented in future. OK, and while thinking about uh, um, trends um, from the social commerce, we can have like popular hints coming coming from from experts uh, that says that um, according to statista studies uh, the average the average value of of, of uh, social commerce purchase is still below uh, 100 dollars and due to that experts comment that uh, it's good to start with selling on social media like cheaper products at the beginning and Atis, Atis had mentioned uh, during the, um, the Generation Z part of, the, of my presentation, uh, social media is a place where, where people search for promotions. So it's also good to, to be focused, to display in first order these products that are somehow discounted. Um, yeah, the second strategy is to limit products range to companies bestseller at the beginning. Uh, we can also see that more social media platforms are de delivering to business clients the ability of, of uh, customization, their stores. Uh, it's mainly, mainly about playing with, with layout and handling collections, uh, collections of products uh, in a smart way. But as we can see, it's also about multimedia, which uh, may easily enrich the user experience. Uh, the next thing are shoppable videos. Uh, it's it's like super hot currently. Uh, Instagram has it, TikTok has it, and Facebook has it when it comes to live streaming. Okay, the next thing is um, the next area I I will tell you about is buy now pay later, so easily accessible uh, deferred payments. Um, and oh, something happened. Okay. It works. So uh, in 2021, uh, and the overall online online spending uh, came from the buy now pay uh, later solutions valued six percent. Uh, but predict predictions says say that the, the the growth here will be like steady and will reach 13 percent uh, of all online uh, transactions by uh, 2025. Um, I, I put the, the, the chart here uh, to show you the most common reasons reasons why, why people decide to go for such paying methods. Um, uh, these are people from US. So they do it to avoid paying, paying with, uh, uh, with credit cards and to make uh, purchases that otherwise would not fit their budget. 
Uh, and there are two things I would uh, like to tell you. Uh, so first of all, it's the trend um, that financial providers are offering their own portals where users can browse all uh, online stores uh, integrated uh, with uh, this one specific payment system. So here you can see the example of Afterpay uh, Marketplace where um, where the company uh, is bringing together all these uh, merchants, let's say. Uh, okay, and the second thing, uh, there, the, here we've got an example of Klarna, uh, that is another leader uh, when it comes to buy now, uh, pay later uh, systems. Um, and I consider the, the, the company's mobile app as something that, that will become a, a big thing, let's say. And uh, first of all, Klarna merged with Hero, and Hero is one of the most known uh, live commerce providers. So those, th these providers that um, uh, that are offering live streams uh, shopping. Uh, secondly, other features uh, of Klarna uh, include in the app are uh, serving content based on uh, customers' interests and the their favorite stores, uh, exclusive deals, uh, and price drops uh, notification that can be unlocked with uh, based on, on some kind of loyalty systems. Uh, delivery tracking on all Klarna and non-Klarna bot items, uh, spending overviews and monthly budgeting, one-click payments, returns, and even, as you can see here, uh, CO2 emission tracker. But uh, there is a dark side of uh, BNPL. Uh, market, uh, more and more experts from social and financial uh, sectors uh, criticizes, uh, criticize uh, BNPL uh, solutions for having an, a negative impact uh, on people's um, behaviors, they, they buying patterns and its, uh, uh, and its consequences. So here are some examples. Uh, in general, using uh, BNPL solutions um, affect that user who used it once are more likely to credit and get into debts. Uh, that's for sure. 25% of users that made at least one such a payment have negative, 25%, have negative experience according that and regret paying this way. So this is something that I should, uh, that I, I think that uh, you should uh, take into consideration while thinking about implementing such solutions. And these data are coming from um, British government. Okay, and the next thing is guided shopping. Uh, and to, to, describe, to describe what I understand by, by guided shopping, uh, it's relevant to mention uh, studies coming from Gartner and Gartner formulated how customer perceive um, personalization and divided it into two categories. The first is recognition and the, the second is help me through the buying journey. The first, so the recognition is about ability of gathering data uh, coming from users and to display it, to display it. Like for example, um, by communicating with the user's name. Yeah, for instance. But the second category, so help me through the buying journey um, is, is um, uh, it's about uh, it's about helping users with solving their problems. So uh, what respondents and, and this category is um, is considered uh, by respondent as this much more uh, valuable. And the problems that user uh, considered to be the most important what the ones that they need to 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 be guided with are um, getting better deal, save some time provide information users don't uh, users hadn't before, uh, make the purchase process easier and less confusing, make users aware about new products and help them de decide between two products. Um, and and this, these problems I mentioned, um, all this coming from the help through um, the buying journey is something that guided shopping approach, uh, that, guided, that the guided shopping should approach. And there are two uh, solutions I would like you to and I would like to to show you. So here we've got some quizzes. Uh, so here is an example of quiz where users are asked a series of questions to to detect uh, the best product for the user. 
the same is coming here. So uh, there is another example of such a such a product advisory, uh, which is intended to detect like the, the best uh, product for the user. And also it happens after uh, answering some question, uh, some questions. Uh, okay, the, the conversational commerce. So um, that, that's also part of uh, guided shopping. And uh, here, when we think about chat solutions, uh, we may think about uh, chats that serve, uh, help users with, with customer serving issues, uh, customer service issues, like here in the reserved case, where we can uh, check the order tracking uh, directly from the chat by conversation. But the, the second thing is also that conversational commerce is intended to, to support the decision-making process. Like here in the case of, of Tommy Hilfiger, where uh, chatbot here recommends uh, products based on the conversation, based on what user asked, what users uh, typed. Okay, and the last thing, uh, the last digital area is ARVR. So, um, so I will start from uh, another studies from eMarketer that shows that AR is more accessible uh, for users than VR and will be growing uh, um, more than, a than, than VR within next years. Uh, so for now, 21% uh, of US users said that they used AR uh, at least once a month in uh, the year uh, 2020. So that's really a lot. Um, and, and here I have like three trends to be covered. Uh, the first is virtual try-ons. So uh, more and more um, try-ons uh, providers are, are virtual try-ons providers are coming to the market. Uh, like here, we can see a, a company called Wona. Uh, it is focused on, on delivering a virtual trying on solutions uh, for shoes retailers. That's the one example. Um, yeah, uh, the second is the case of Moscat that via mobile uh, web page offers users to, to try their glasses uh, out, uh, including different sizes. So you can also compare uh, how products of different sizes look at your face, uh, on your face. Uh, yeah. And the next thing while speaking about the size advisory, uh, it's, it's worth taking note that um, some, com some, uh, some, uh, some companies are are attempting to, to help users with, with the detection of the uh, right size through the AR solutions, through the AR, uh, AR technologies. But, uh, but, but to be honest, uh, apart from the Moscat case that I, I shown you, uh, I haven't found anything uh, that will be a working solution. Um, I mean, in a field of AR and, and measurements doing by AR technologies, there are many concepts like here, um, but not not be not proven uh, with successful uh, implementation. Yeah, and the last thing, uh, uh, almost the last. Okay, so uh, here we've got AR runways. Uh, it's something that gently appears uh, in, in my uh, in the research um, while while uh, discovering the AR fashion trends. It brings users closer to, to the experiences they otherwise would not have opportunity to, to go through so in real life. And the next, and this is the last, uh, is Google AR products. So um, it's about cooperation between brands and Google. Uh, here is an example of Barbary. So after searching uh, some specific product uh, from Barbary, uh, in the Google, uh, users are able to, to display this uh, product directly from the search result page uh, in, in, in AR via the, their, their phones. Yep, and I guess uh, there is last thing I would like to, to show you because um, when Innovation Lab has some breaks between uh, these innovation sprints, uh, conducted for our business partners, uh, we, we try to involve Devanta employees to create some concepts answering these this hottest trends. And here's one concept uh, coming, coming from uh, Innovation Lab that you might be interested in. Um. 
Let me tell you about Circular. Circular is a marketplace app for finding and buying clothes at secondhand shops with the ability to customize them by the various craftsmen. It helps small mom and pop stores enter the digital world with no effort while making the younger generation look cool. And all of that while reducing the harmful footprint of fast fashion. The e-commerce engine of our platform is Commerce Tools. And because it's headless, we can easily add other functional elements of the application. The target group that places particular emphasis on sustainability, supports local businesses, and at the same time wants to look unique, is Generation Z. Circular allows them to buy used clothes from local second-hand shops without leaving their phones. Shopping in a stationary second-hand shop can be a bit overwhelming because of the vast amount of stuff, and often ends up just on browsing. But in Circular, you can upload a photo of your complete outfit or a look you like. Because we've used Algolia, the app will find the right products that will fit your style. And if you don't know what you're looking for, a visual stylist will help you. Based on a built-in quiz, it will determine your style and choose the right outfits. You don't have to worry that the jacket you like is too big. Circular combines products with craftsmen in your area who can tailor or fix them to fit your needs. Right away, you can choose a tailor service that will do it for you. You can view other users' comments and reviews to select the best option. Gen Z wants to be bold. They look for the style to express their uniqueness. Our panel with inspirations show what users may like, suggesting a product and a service that will allow them to achieve outstanding custom effect. Because we've used Contentful as a headless CMS, we can serve dynamic and individual content tailored to the individual user. For second-hand shops, entering the online sphere with Circular is very simple. Thanks to the tech of Algolia, the app recognizes what's in the picture, so adding a product doesn't take more than 10 seconds. Our app also suggests a price, so in fact, all they have to do is to take a photo. Circular also automatically combines second-hand products into sets, so that the customers can buy and enjoy the entire look. Circular connects generations for sustainable fashion. Mm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so um, I guess that's 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 all from my side. Oh no 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 no! Stop. Uh, thank you. I hope that it was um, somehow insightful. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Agatha, for your presentation and the, such a great overview, overview of the trends uh, for the fashion industry. And last but not least, Julermo, you can hand over. Okay. Um, everything's okay. Well, Agatha, congratulations. Really interesting insights. And um, well, today the idea is to talk about how to excel at the e-commerce for the fashion industry in specific. And well, to give you a quick insight about me, I work at Pixie CX. I've been a commerce solution architect for quite a while, but well, after a few years, uh, getting my hands dirty with uh, large complex pro technology projects, I realized that, well, sometimes it's, it's important to actually see what's behind that technology project, that development, that platform that's going to be implemented, and to actually try to make the most of that. Today, I'm wearing my favorite shirt. It's kind of a complex day because, well, besides from this talk, we I'm getting married with Pili. Uh, here is what I was doing today in the morning. Let me see. That's the outfit for Saturday. So, well, uh, I need some luck for today. As to get started with the talk, this is uh, the agenda. It's not the typical agenda, what, but well, it is the agenda. There is no actually a silver bullet or a golden rule to succeed at the e-commerce for the fashion industry, but it's really important to do three things. To understand our context, what's our company, our products, what's going on with the industry, with our competition. To know where we're headed, and that's where 
Agatha's insights, I think, are really, really useful and valuable. And then having the cap capabilities. And um, when I talk about capabilities, I talk about resources, processes, and a structure that will allow you to actually, given the current context, survive nowadays while having a consistent strategy to achieve your objectives in the future. Then as for resources, resources would be people and would be technical platforms nowadays, mostly. As for processes, the way the resources will be interacting, who will manage which project and which platform and who will talk with who and who will control who. And as for structure, uh, the structure for those resources and processes to work as fluently as possible. As I said, this is the agenda. So we will start with a quick glimpse of the context. And this is kind of generic because, well, I cannot go by one, one by one and then talk a bit about where we're headed. And finally, about the capabilities, I will dive into resources because, well, that's that's basically the only place we can go because as for processes and structure, it really depends on the company and the, the context to make it uh, efficient. As for the industry review, it's really important to take into account that fashion industry is growing, but at the same time, e-commerce penetration in this industry is growing a lot. As it's growing more than the industry itself. And well, those are the numbers. There is not that much to it that to know that we are on an expanding market on an expanding channel in the online space. Then as for every industry, there are opportunities and there are threats. As for the opportunities, the global markets for fashion are still expanding, are still growing. Increased online access and this keep on growing of smartphones for everyone is something that we could leverage on. The emerging worldwide middle class is something that makes some fashions more available for some people. And then, as Agatha was mentioning, the harnessing power of celebrities and influencers can really be something that you can leverage on and gain some interesting fraction. Then as for threats, which sadly are always around and we all need to look out for them. Brand loyalty nowadays is really, really complex due to a very saturated market. There are many brands there many things going on in social media, in the streets, everywhere. Pressure from consumers regarding ethically sourced goods, uh, ethically de uh, delivered package and so on. And well, uh, keeping up with technology is always a threat. Nowadays with NFTs, with metaverse, with many new trends appearing when you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with my with my technology structure, everything arrives and it's that part is really complex to achieve. That's it basically as for context. And now thinking about where we're headed, the first thing that we need to look out for is that personalization has been a trend for quite a few years now, but now it's actually a balancing act between, okay, we need to leverage artificial intelligence to deliver superior experiences that feel like they were made for each of the customers. And there are tools that we can use for that, such as Algolia for searches, Nosto for what would be personalization of the experience as for banners and product recommendations, and Emarsis as a marketing platform, which would do more of a omni-channel strategy as for marketing. But well, having those in mind, it's always important to have consent of the users and to have real clear boundaries and respecting their preferences. Because if we harm those, those privacy concerns of users, we may lose them and not in a very nice way nowadays. It's important to ask customers what they want and how they feel. For this, there are companies using Qualtrics, for, for example. And where uh, nowadays customer data platform is really a key asset. It's not, again, as the name of this agenda, it's not a silver bullet, 
there is a lot of work, there is a lot of friction into unifying all of the data there. But well, uh, the idea is that once that everything is unified and organized there, it's a really powerful tool to have first pair data and then to move it around the, the entire technology ecosystem for the company. I forgot to mention Stylytics. It's a really cool solution that you can plug into your site and will give you uh, look recommendations or there are companies using it for, okay, uh, spring uh, night out with friends and it will give you recommendation of complete looks with things you can buy in the store. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice way, I think, to approach to customers through a personalized need more than a personalized user. Then moving forward, the next trend is to be into the metaverse. There are many ways to go into the metaverse. Agatha mentioned quite a few. And well, it's something that's actually open to interpretation. It's, it's the only important thing is to know that it will occur inside a virtual society. This can be Roblox, it can be Fortnite, it can be Minecraft, it can be inside Oculus with many things. And well, another key asset for this are NFTs. NFTs are, well, the monkeys that Neymar bought and many celebrities did as well, but at the same time, they are non-fungible tokens. And well, this means that it's something digital that you cannot transfer, for example. Many people can have this, but this, this one, it will be only mine. The same can happen with can happen with NFTs. There are things that are unique and there are things that there are many copies, but someone owns them. As for NFTs in the metaverse, many, many brands have done collaborations and have, guy, have gained some interesting traction around that collaboration. Some examples are Forever 21 and their first store in the Roblox world are Balenciaga and Fortnite as for a collaboration to dress up your avatar and Tommy Hilfiger in Roblox as well with uh, clothing and different approaches to uh, improve the experience of Tommy Hilfiger fans while at Roblox. Here there are a few more of the collaborations that occurred only last year as for big brands. And I think that for 2022, this is going to be much more large, much more uh, enriching as for users. And companies are really working hard into being present also in that space. I'll give you a, a quick glimpse of this, but the Jordan sneakers for Fortnite were a huge hit. Animal Crossing and Gucci was really interesting as well. And well, it's, it's an experiment. Uh, it's something new and we should start taking this into account. Moving forward, and this is something that maybe was already kind of talked about through, but not maybe in this way, is that, well, nowadays, okay, let's maybe start with the past. In the past, Having paid advertisement as for Google, as for social media was great. Uh, the return on investment was perfect. But well, nowadays with the death of the cookie and starting to work on first party data, the return on investment, it, it, there is a point in which it's not so great anymore. So well, some brands started working on storytelling, started working on doing things the right way started working on customer satisfaction and being great at it, started working on providing superior experiences. And well, uh, from my perspective, those are the new Google Ads. It's way more difficult, but it pays off in the end. The needs for having this brand building strategy are a powerful digital experience platform, a good architecture as for the commerce solution, and a marketing platform that will support the, all of the channels that the company is in and is nurtured with a well-nurtured customer data platform. 
Another really interesting trend that is around is the sustainability agenda. I think that many brands around there in the fashion industry specifically are working really hard into achieve different objectives of having more transparency, taking care of animals, reducing their carbon footprint, having organic materials, having uh, social responsibility. And well, this is something that's really strong in the fashion agenda. But at the same time, it's really important that if you are doing it, you should show it. This is something that customers are, are really critical of. So if you are doing it, they are really good and they are really happy with that. So it's not something to be left behind. Ideas to do this, and for this, again, you should have a really strong uh, digital content platform, is to have a good product clear information. And here I'm using some examples brought from Patagonia, which is a brand I, I like basically because of this. And well, they talk about how each of the products are made and where it's made and how does it actually arrive into your door. They also talk about their environmental campaign causes and the current status of them. And well, this is something that really raises an eyebrow when you say, okay, 94% of the materials they use are recycled. That's, that's great. I want to wear that. And well, finally, we have EcoCart as a, an emerging company with a really interesting value proposal that it doesn't actually work on your sustainability agenda, but it does because it offers customers to make their order, their order carbon neutral. And I mean, you can uh, deliver the package by bike and in a, in a paper box, in a paper bag, but the products will still be manufactured. They will still be on a boat. They will still consume, consume carbon while the servers are up during the purchase. So there is an option when you're doing the purchase to make your other carbon neutral, which makes people feel good, makes the company look good. And well, it's, it's another way to achieve success at the sustainability agenda as for fashion. Moving forward, it has happened that, well, due to COVID going down, it looks like brick and mortar is it's starting to gain some more traction. 22% of online users actually returned their products because it didn't look and it wasn't actually what they were looking for. Looking at a product online and buying it physically, it's something that's happening a lot and vice versa as well using buy online and pick up in store and adding extra items while being at the store. Gymshark and Smith are examples of fashion online stores that were opening actual stores. But well, those are not the only alternatives to succeed at this. I mean, as for adding extra items, there are plenty of alternatives out there. As to make products look more like what they're actually going to get, there are alternatives as well. And well, some examples are related with, for example, sizing. And there are something that's really simple, and I think it adds a lot of value, is to talk about the, pe the person that's wearing actually the piece of clothing. I mean, she's wearing a size S, this is the size, and this is the type of body. Uh, well, that, that example I got from Nike, Having videos of products also helps a lot. Having 3D models as the ones that Agatha was showing in artificial, no, no, in augmented reality. And well, finally having a live shopping in which someone actually shows the product. Sometimes you can even ask questions, they will answer. And that helps a lot because well, despite the fact that you can open up a store, it will not always be around everyone. And well, the idea now is to leverage from the global market and not only from the small ones. Moving forward and when going about social, 
Nowadays, people stand, spend 15% of their lives in a social media app. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's crazy. In-app shopping, it's expected to grow by three times by 2025. And one third of Facebook users are planning to make a purchase through the platform in 2022. People actually love videos before purchased, and well, TikTok and Instagram are really praised for it. And well, having a blend, having a, a well organized set of real time information about the current trends for your fashion competitors, your, your sub segment of the fashion industry, let's say at leisure, having knowledge of the audience, having knowledge of what the influencers are doing, the, what the competitors are doing, will give you a much clearer and much more valuable insight as for real time context. And it's something that's really interesting to do for this uh, IQ. It's a company that can support. And uh, well, I think it's, it's a really interesting insight to try to, to gain as for working in a more agile way in real time. As for social commerce, bidirectional integration is something that's great. Nike is doing it. it. They ask you to tag your piece of clothing in your Instagram post, and they will make you look featured in the product detail page. It's something that not only encourages you to buy and upload the photo, but it makes you feel confident that people are wearing it, people are uploading it to their social media, which nowadays upload a social media blog, a social media post is, it's a lot. And well, regarding live stream shopping, it's on its heyday. It's something that will be growing. I imagine that in three or four years, most of the big companies will have a head of live stream or live shopping. The most, norm, the most normal experiences nowadays are one too many. For example, Amazon does that a lot in which there is someone showing different pieces of clothing and everyone seeing, but there are more exclusive experience of one to one in which someone can be actually at the store showing you things and you can select. Well, and here I'll stop just for a quick second. And all of those trends are really cool, but are not simple to achieve. There are many things to be done as to allow our resources to gain the actual capabilities to work around this. I mean, we cannot say, okay, I want to do work in the metaverse and put some money on it and it will occur. There is work to be done. There are platforms to be gained, implemented, learned and well about that is that well the first thing to think about is to have a powerful content platform this will allow the marketing and commercial team to excel with much better speed which much more clear much more better how can i put this a much better tool a much better solution to gain traction in the online space and not only in the online space, also in the mobile one, also in in-store experiences, content platforms nowadays not only work on the e-commerce, but can do, can do it in all of the digital touch points as for the brand. Then having a front-end as a service as the one of View Storefront or Spartacus if you are running an SAP, having Netlify if you are running, uh, well, actually any, JavaScript based frontend is something that will, get, will give you much better speed and a much more solid architecture as for the frontend. Then moving forward, data platforms are really important to unify and organize information. It's really important to have proper information about products, about inventory, about transactions, about page views, about interactions in the store, about seconds seeing a specific image, all of that that you would get in your Google Analytics or in your food story back in the day. Nowadays, really important to see it inside a unified data platform that then will support a really, really big advantage as for marketing, as for
for supply chain, as for the financial department. I mean, every part of the company will gain a lot from having all of the information properly organized. I think a really nice example of this is Shane. The Chinese company gained a lot of traction and is it's not fast fashion. I think nowadays it's actually real time fashion. They they actually bring up new pieces of clothing every day and they do it to a really mature data structure and a really short supply chain. They know data about Google Trends, their competitors, their online stores, their applications. And based on that is that they are creating pieces of clothing every day. Then as for some other important resources. I'm again going to talk about customer data platform. Here, customer data platforms are really, really important to organize data. You'll get data from your physical store, from your marketing, from your online store, from an event, from a pop-up you were part of, from a joint event, from a sustainable campaign, from many places. And all of that should travel to a unified source of truth that will be different from having everything in the marketing platform. Because for the marketing platform, that's great. But at the same time, that data may be used for more things than marketing. There are quite a few customer data platforms out there. I only looked at SAP. Um, it's a really interesting solution. It also comes with login support and consent support, which is really important as to make users feel confident that their data is gonna be treated in an appropriate way. Then marketing platforms. And this is something that's that's growing. It's, it's growing a lot. And it's, it's basically three things. It's digital commerce, okay? Customizing experiences across the different sales channels. It's marketing, it's customizing marketing campaign content, messaging, engaging across different channels, web, mail, page searches, advertising, mobile. And finally, it's customer experience. It's customizing the online and offline experiences across different business functions and in service to increase customer satisfaction, to increase brand loyalty, to gain advocacy through different chatbots, digital kiosks, or well, anything you can imagine. Then moving to my, my sweet spot, e-commerce platforms. I, I chose three there to, to have different points of view of what a commerce platform can do. If you are in need of a com complex solution, but not a complex e-commerce. You have Swell, which is a really growing uh, e-commerce headless solution that works really well with subscriptions and has a really interesting architecture. If you have a more complex and a more enterprise level commerce need, you can go with Elastic Path, which is also composable. So you can leverage everything around it. And it, for Elastic Path, it will be only commerce. And then if you do not have the entire stack, you can go with SAP Commerce Cloud, which I think it's really great at commerce. It's not so great at speed and traction as for an agile project, but at the same time, it's not so great in comparison to a composable approach, but it's the perfect solution if you are not in a maturity level to have a company that's actually working around the content on its own. And if you know the, if you do not have the actual resources in person, in structure, in processes, SAP Commerce, it's a great school to learn how to do all of this and to create the different areas and so on. I mean, it's basically the most used solution nowadays for the big brands along with, I, I think, Salesforce. There are all other complexities that may come up, such as promotions. And for, their, for that, there is Talon One as a promotion engine. 
you might need support with searches. And there, there is a, it, searches is a really complex thing, you know, because if you Google shirt without black stripes, Google will give you a shirt with black stripes. I mean, it's a search engine. It's not a, a person. It's artificial intelligence. It's not human. And well, as for that, most, most, most of the search engines on the stores, actually in world-class stores that I look out, are in need of some enhancements. And there, Algolia can do the trick. Algolia can help you personalize results based on browsing history, based on based on which banner it clicked, based on the the product that brings the best equity to the brand based on inventory, based on many things. So you just put the, the stuff you need into it and it'll do the work. And well, finally, a product information system. It's really useful either for sourcing your products back at the factory or your, your vendor and as for the end point in which you end up selling them and through your e-commerce platform or your online store. For that, Akaneo, Akeneo and Stevo are really strong providers, platforms actually. I think, okay, that's Uruguay, that's, that's my country. And well, if you are thinking about a digital strategy for a brand, if you are looking for a new social commerce approach, if you like the conversation, I would like to know a bit more. You can drop a line through LinkedIn or through my email. I work at Pixie CX in Uruguay. It's a really cool customer experience technical powerhouse. We are based mostly in Latin America. And if you need to grow an agile team or need a task force for a really complex technology problem, we can also help. So you can always drop a line. That's my email. And well, that would be it on my side, Aga. Thanks. Thank you, Tulermo, for your presentation. And yeah, we came to an end of our event today. Thank you all for taking part in the webinar. I hope to that you enjoyed time spending with us. Uh, and in the next few days, you can expect the email with the recording, presentation, and the summary of the event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good one.